start our live stream. And thank you, Zoom, for the notification. All right. So here we go. Start our live stream. Oh, and I'm echoing. I always do that. All right, folks. Now that we have all of our technical stuff worked out officially, welcome to our program. Um, so tonight's program is Seattle's Maritime History Lake Union. I'm Taylor Roden. I'm the Community Events Manager here at Historic Seattle. And our mission is saving meaningful places to foster lively communities. And this program is definitely, definitely a pretty clear example of the work that we do. So thanks for joining us. We'll be together for about an hour today. And we're going to hear from some pretty awesome folks. I'll introduce them in just a couple of minutes. That our properties and programs occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. This acknowledgement is not a substitute for developing relationships with Indigenous communities or for honoring Indigenous stories as we share our collective history, but it's a first step in recognizing the people whose land we occupy. And before we dive into the program and I introduce our guests, uh, we have to thank our sponsors, of course, for making our education programming possible and accessible. So thank you to Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers Local 1, Washington and Alaska, Daniels Real Estate, The Greystone, and The Lodge at St. Edward Park, and Selen Construction. And I also want to expend, extend a few thank yous. Um, one to my historic Seattle team, especially uh, Jeff, thank you for making this possible. Thank you to David and Mike Wagner. Um, in addition to this program, you all in a few weeks will see a virtual house, a virtual tour of the Wagner Floating Home. A bit of a teaser. I will definitely email all of us here when that's available. Um, it'll be on YouTube. But thank you um, to both of you for letting us into your home for hours uh, to record um, all of that great stuff. Okay. And I told you I'd be brief, so I really am going to be brief. Uh, so tonight we are going to hear from two special guests, Roger Fernandez and Sarah Martin. We're, we're going to hear from Roger first, and then we will. I'll come back and I'll do a brief intro for Sarah. Sarah is going to do her presentation, and then at the very end, at about 6.45ish, we will um, take your questions and we'll do a nice Q&A. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and put those in the chat. I'll be keeping track and I'll moderate our Q&A at the very end. And that's it, pretty short, sweet, simple program. My last reminder before welcoming Roger is just that all of our programs are a safe space for all of our participants and our presenters. And we do not tolerate racism, sexism, homophobic comments, discriminations, insults, all of the bad things that we all know that we're not supposed to be doing, right? Um, and so we just ask that everyone present be respectful of this space for listening, for learning, and for exploration. So with that, I am done. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming our first guest, Roger Fernandez. Thank you, my friends. Um, thank you for asking me to share this evening with you. My name is Roger Fernandez. I belong to the Lower Elwa Clallam tribe. Clallam County is named after us on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, but our real name is not Clallam, it is Nixclayam. And the English speakers couldn't say our name, so they call us Clallam, not Nixclayam, but it means strong people. And you probably know that the city of Seattle is named after a man, um, Seat, and that was his name, but there's no in English, so they changed it to Seattle. Um, you might also know the first people of several parts of this land here in the Seattle area are called Duwamish, but their traditional name is Duch Apsh. Duch Apsh means people of the inside. And so one small push we might do is let's say the names right. Um, I'm gonna sing for you a song before I get started, a short song. Um, as the people of this land, Puget Sound region, um, the Wulch, the center of the world, uh, as they traveled around the salt water in their canoes, they would sing songs. These songs were a way of finding the beat the, to, to put your oars, the paddles into the water at the same time. The beat of the song put the paddle in the water so we could work together. Uh, another reason is when you are doing hard work like paddling a canoe or lifting heavy boxes with a bunch of people, it's, if you sing, it makes that job easier because your spirits are joined in that work. And then um, another reason is uh, a way of announcement. 
that as you're approaching another village, you would sing these songs. Oh, the Clallam people are coming. The Clallam people are coming to visit us. So this is a Clallam, next Clallam song. It's called the Clumachin, which means uh, killer whale, orca whale. Um, and it's a, just a short song. They would sing these songs so the people of this land would know our songs. We're coming to visit them. They would hear our songs and we would hear their songs as they approached our villages. So this is a Clumachin. <clears throat> And so you would sing this and other songs as you paddle your canoes. And again, we'd be familiar with everyone's songs from their family, their village, their people. And so that is the Clallam Clumachin. You might have heard the word Clumachin. We need blackfish in our language, which is the uh, name for the orca whale we had, the blackfish. And you heard the part going, whoo, whoo. That is a breath of the whale. As it comes out of the water, lets out a breath of air, right? Whoo. And so that part of the song was to talk to the whale in its own language. Whoo, whoo, whoo. So thank you for letting me share these kind of things with you. But I'm a storyteller and an artist. Those things are um, linked together. Our stories become the art our people create to share with one another. And so I'm gonna share some stories with you. I'm a storyteller, which means I'm a teacher. I'm not telling these stories to entertain you. I'm telling these stories to teach you about my people and not just teach you things that um, you might observe, but things that they carry in their heart, philosophies, values, beliefs, all the things in the stories you must find. Um, so my kind of education, storytelling education is not like a school. Cool. I'm not going to give you a test at the end. You got to get the right answer. The stories I'm going to share, you will look within the story and find the things that have meaning to you. And so uh, I'm going to start with a short story because I want you to look at this story in terms of what is it teaching? He said it's going to teach me something. What is it teaching me? And again, he's not going to explain what he expects you to learn. You have to find that yourself. And you might learn something he, the storyteller, never thought of before because you hear the story with your own ears and you see the world with your own eyes. And so therefore you might see something I could never see. So this story is very simple. I'm gonna tell the story. Um, I must tell you there's a powerful big mythic story called Moon the Transformer that many of the tribes around here have a version of. It's about a being who came to the world when there were no humans in the world. And he got the world ready for humans. He created salmon, his first act creating salmon. He created all the trees in the forest. He created, um, uh, rabbits and he created deer and he created beavers and he created all these plants and berries and so his work was to change the world and get it ready for humans. Um, I'll tell you that much about him and here's an example of a story that the people tell here about the changer, Moon the Transformer and so it goes. The changer was coming down the rivers from the mountains coming down to the salt water and finally after a long time of traveling, changing the world, he came to the salt water and he looked around and said, this is the most beautiful place in the world. I don't have to go any further. My travels are done. My travels are done. The world is ready now. Well, he saw a group of people standing on the beach and they were talking very excitedly, talking and talking. And he went up and listened to them and he could hear them talking about people that weren't here. They weren't around, but they were talking about people that they knew and they were talking behind their backs. They were saying very private things they probably shouldn't say. They were, they were saying things that, well, they were gossiping. These people were excitedly gossiping to each other on the beach. And so the changer, they, they did not know they were talking to the changer, these people. He went up to them and said, you people should not gossip. It's not good to talk about people behind their backs. You should stop this now. Gossiping is not good. And they looked at him and they said, we don't know who you are. We've never seen you before. You can't tell us what to do. We'll talk about anybody any way we want. And they turned and they kept gossiping. He said, I'm telling you, I'm warning you, stop gossiping. It's not a good thing. You shouldn't talk about people behind their backs like this. And they looked at him again. You can't tell us what to do. We'll talk about anybody any way we want. And they turned and kept gossiping. He said, well, you like to gossip. That means you have big mouths. You have big mouths. So I will turn you into 
the being with the biggest mouth of all. And so we turn them into clams. He turned them into clams. And as you know, a clam is all mouth, isn't it? And he said to the clams, I'm going to put you under the sand and under the water now. And you, that is where you will live. And people will dig you up for their food, but you'll be under the sand and the water. And whenever you open your mouth to gossip, water and sand will rush into your mouth. This is your punishment for gossiping. And so he placed the, the, the clam people under the sand. And that is where they are now, under the sand and under the water. Their punishment for gossiping. But you think that stopped them from gossiping? Of course not. People enjoy it too much, apparently. And so whenever you walk across in wet and muddy beach, you'll see little spurts of water coming from under the sand. That is a clam people. And they're talking. And they're talking about you. And that is all. The simple story called the gossiping clams. And again, you might look at it as a very simple um, message in that story of don't gossip. In a small village, that could tear the village apart. In a big city, you might get away with it. I don't know. Um, but uh, gossiping, of course. But then the other thing is, they did not know they were talking to the transformer, the changer. You must respect even a stranger for having powers you might not understand, for having gifts you might not appreciate, for having something about them we don't know. So have respect for the people you don't know if you just met this stranger. Have respect for them. So again, subtle things like that are in these stories. Um, I don't mean to explain, I'm not trying to explain the story to you. I'm just sharing what people shared with me and what I found in the story. So I want to tell you a story from this land itself, right around here. Now, as I mentioned before, the Duwamish people, the Muckleshoot people, um, they really come from small villages all along the rivers and all along the salt water. Um, there's a group of people that were called the Shilcho Apsh, which again, Shilchol Bay is, uh, uh, takes their name, Shilchol Bay, Shilcho Apsh. And there's also another group called the Hachu Apsh, the Big Lake people, the people who live along Lake Washington. So there were many, many uh, environments here, the salt water, the rivers, the lakes, the lowlands of the mountains, all these special places people lived in, and they were known for where they lived, and their name um, reflected that. This story comes from the people who lived down by, um, well, the bend of the Duwamish River, there's a real place there. It's at the bend, um, there's a Boeing um, access, uh, Bo Boeing um, personnel plant at 116th and Highway 99. There's a bend in the river there. There's now a walking bridge across that bend. And there's a park, park there. I believe it's called the Cecil Moses Park. Um, and it's a walking park. And there's a story that goes with that exact place, that bend in the river. Now I'm gonna tell you the abbreviated version of the story because it is a pretty long story, but um, I want to get to the points where I think you might say, well, what is that teaching me? What is that about? So it comes from these people, the Duch Apsh people, the people of the inside. That's their name. Duch means inside. Apsh becomes Mish in English. Apsh means people of, people of the inside. And around here, you hear the suffix Mish quite a bit. Duwamish, Stilaguamish, Kakomish, uh, uh, Skykomish, um, the Mish name, Snohomish. The Mish means people of that place. So that place is named after those people. A long time ago, in a bend of the Duwamish River, a few miles upstream from the salt water, there were two villages on either side of the river. On the north side was North Wind and his people. North Wind was a headman of his village. On the opposite bank was South Wind and his village and his people. And he was the headman of his village. North Wind and South Wind lived in villages opposite banks of the same river. Well, both of them fell in love with the same young woman, and they courted her. And after a time, the young woman, she chose to be with Southwind, which made Northwind angry. He was very upset about this, very angry. Well, after a time, she married Southwind, moved to his village, and after another time, she had a baby, a child, which drove Northwind crazy. He did something insane. We could not imagine why he would do such a thing, but he was so crazy now in his anger that he ordered his people who were called the ice people, Northwind's village people were called the ice people, to cross the river and to attack Southwind's village and to do this terrible thing, to kill everyone in the village except for the young woman and her baby. And so the ice people crossed the river and in a terrible massacre, they killed everyone in Southwind's village except for the young woman and her baby and unbeknownst to them, the mother of Southwind, the grandmother of the baby who climbed up to a hill nearby to hide and escape the terrible massacre. Well, the young woman is brought to Northwind and he said, I will marry you now, I will marry you and I will be the father to your son. I will be his father. I will be 
I will raise him as my own son, but you must promise me for this to happen. You may never tell him who his real father was. You may never tell him what I did to his father. And to save her child, the young woman agreed. She married Northwind and never spoke of Southwind again. Well, the ice people turned this into a land of cold and ice and snow. It was like an eternal winter. The land was covered in ice and snow. And they even built an ice dam across the river, right at that place, that bend in the river. They built an ice dam that blocked the river and blocked the salmon from returning up river. The people of river, they were hungry. I mean, it was like an eternal winter. They needed all the food they could get. And they would come down and try to fish around the dam. They were chased away with spears. Some people tried to destroy the dam to free the river, but they were killed with bows and arrows. So no one could stop the work of the ice people, building that dam and bringing a winter upon the people that lasted a long time. Well, the young man in the stories, as our old stories go, grew very quickly to a, from a little boy to a baby to a young man, grew very quickly. And he would go out hunting. And he was told whenever he would go out hunting for his people, you may go anywhere you want, anywhere you want to go hunting, but never go up this hill over here, never go up this hill. And finally, one day, out of his curiosity, he went up to the top of that hill and saw a little shack made of old sticks and wood. And he looked inside that little shack. And there was an old woman sitting there wearing an old blanket. She had a little grass fire, no heat at all. And, and there was uh, white streaks on her face and ice covering her face. And he said, hello, old woman, how are you? And she looked at him and said, I am fine, grandson. I am fine. He said, oh, I'm not your grandson. My grandmother lives in the village below. She said, no, I am your real grandmother. That woman is not your grandmother. I am your grandmother. And she explained the whole story to him of what had happened when he was a baby, how Northwind killed his father and turned this into a land of cold and ice and snow. And he was angry. He never had heard this story before, and he was angry, and he wanted to fight Northwind. But she said, you're not strong enough yet. You're not strong enough. You must become stronger before you fight him. When you fight him, let me know. I'm a basket maker, and I can help you. Well, the young man asked her many questions, and then he went off and became stronger. He became stronger. He became so strong, they say, he could put his arms around a tree and pull it out of the ground by its roots and throw that tree into the river. And that tree would float down the river and crash into the ice dam. He did it again and again and again, uprooting these trees and throwing them into the river. He would float down and crash into the ice dam. The ice people were worried. Too many trees might break the dam. And so they climbed in the river. They tried to lift the, those logs out of the river, but the logs were so heavy, they couldn't do it. They couldn't move one of these logs out of the river. They say he was so strong now, he put his foot, the young man, and they say he was beginning to look like his real father, Southwind. His name was Stormwind. He be, Stormwind would become to look like his father, Southwind. And he, would, he put his foot under one of the logs and flipped it out with just one foot. This is how strong he was now. And so everyone is afraid. This man is so powerful. How did he become so powerful? And the father, Northwind, was frightened. Maybe he knows the real story. Maybe someone told him what I did to his father. So he sent his daughter, the young man's sister, to talk with him. She was wearing beautiful ice jewelry, necklaces and earrings and, and bracelets made of ice. She walked into his house and said, we must speak of our father, Southwind, excuse me, Stormwind. And so he said, I don't want to talk about him. And he blew his warm breath upon her and melted all the jewelry. And now the battle began between Northwind and Southwind. They were fighting and wrestling and knocking each other down, hitting each other. And the grandmother, remember, she said, I would help. I'm a basket maker. Well, how can she help? She took one basket that had a very tight weave and put water in it, sprinkled across the land, made a fine misty rain that began to thaw the ice and snow. She took another basket that had a looser weave, put water in it, sprinkled across the land, made a heavy rain that melted the ice and snow. Then she took a third basket with a very loose weave, put water in it, sprinkled it across the land, made a storm rain that washed away the ice and snow. It even washed away the dam. And so the spell of that terrible winter, that long winter was over now. The ice, the cold, the snow were gone. And Northwind was beaten. And he gave up and he started heading to the north. And the young man who was now his father, he was no longer Stormwind, he was Southwind. He said to Northwind, you may come back and visit your friends and family. I will not interfere with your right to visit them. You may come every November and stay for a while, but when I appear in April, you must leave again. And so this sets up this story, the cycle of the winds. North wind brings winter, comes usually in November, Thanksgiving day storm, election day storm. Those of us old enough might remember those days. And so he brings winter and he will stay 
beyond his welcome if Southwind does not appear in April and bringing warm clouds and rain, his warm breath, the warm wind, and the salmon return when spring returns. And so this story explains in mythic terms the world of the people of this land. I've always appreciated that story because there are so many things within it that have helped me just in my life itself. One thing that was very powerful to me in hearing this story was the idea that, um, remember the part, never go up this hill over here, never go up this hill. Well, he finally went up that hill. He was told not to go up, disobeying his own people. And what did he find up there? His grandmother. And she told him the truth of his life. So if he had done what everyone said, don't go up that hill, he might have still not understood the real truth of his life. How many of us, how many, I've thought to myself, how many hills have I not gone up? Because I'll tell never go up this hill over here. Um, the other part that I find fascinating, because it's a very sophisticated observation, I believe, is that um, the three baskets the grandmother has, the first basket, so we have a problem, an eternal winter, ice, cold, and snow. How do we address that a problem? That's that problem. She took one basket, fine misty rain, thawed the ice and snow. She took a second basket, heavier rain, melted the ice and snow. A third basket, a storm rain that washed away the ice and snow, thawing, melting, washing away. This is how you can address a problem, a social problem, a community problem, a family problem, a personal problem. How do we thaw the condition? How do we melt it? And how do we, when do we know it is washed away? And so again, this story is about um, some obvious things, how the winds and the salmon and um, all these things come together, but it also teaches, because it's a mythic story, some aspects of life that are woven into the story itself. So again, my people and the people of this land, we tell stories, our oldest stories. Um, if you're gonna meet someone for the first time, they can tell you things about themselves, where they were born, where they grew up, their favorite food, their favorite TV shows, the kind of work they do. They can tell us things that we might read in a report that tells us who they are. But to really know who they are, we have to hear their stories. Where, what was you know their family like? And who was their favorite neighbor? And what were their friends? And what did they do? And, and what did they, how do they choose the work they, they're doing now? They would tell us stories so we truly understand them. I believe it's the same with other cultures. If we meet another culture, tell me your stories. Tell me the stories of your people. Tell me so I understand who you really are. Not in the way you interact with the world at that kind of um, important level that we need to know, but how do you interact with the world in here? So again, our stories, especially our mythic stories are critical to here. And that is a, a critical uh, uh, mythic story called North Winds Fishing Weir. There's an actual site down there in a park called um, uh, I believe it's Cecil Moses Park down by 116th and Highway 99, right at the river there. And so there are many sites like this all around the area where stories rose out of that place and the people shared that story that they, they might understand the world and understand how to live in that world. That's a creation story. How did the world come to be? How does the world work? And how do I live in that world in a good way? How did it come to be? How does it work? And how do I live in that world in a good way? And so again, to hear the creation story of other people is to gain a powerful insight to them. So this gesture I've done in the beginning, I'm going to do it now. This gesture among our people, you see it at all our gatherings, like this. This is called putting up your hands to people. Put up your hands to people. Lift them up because they're doing good things. Honor them like this. Put your hands up. Thank you. Hello. Goodbye. You're welcome. Put your hands up like this. I was taught that we learn this gesture, not just by figuring it out, making it up. We looked at the cedar trees, another powerful a partner in, our, in the world that we live in. Cedar tree, look at the top of it. Its branches are like this. And our people say, look at the cedar tree. It's giving thanks every day. Every morning, the cedar tree gives thanks. We must give thanks every day. We must be grateful for all the gifts the world has given us. So again, our people mimic the cedar tree. We give thanks every day. So I want to say Chatningsen in the Klalam language, in the Xklayam language, that means thank you. Nischayach and my friends for letting me share these stories with you. I hope they gave you an insight to the tribes of this region and helped you understand through their eyes how they see the world and how they explain that in their stories. So again, thank you. Thank you very much for letting me share these things with you. Roger, thank you so much for sharing the stories with us, for grounding us and for framing up um, part two of tonight's program that Sarah is going to um, join us in just a moment and, and continue on, really. <laughs> um, thank you so, so much. Um, everyone tuning in here, tuning in on YouTube, 
please uh, feel free to mess or send me your questions or put your questions in the chat, I should say, if you have questions for Roger or for Sarah um, throughout the program. And then in about 20-ish minutes or so, we will um, start our Q&A with everyone else. So, Sarah, I'm going to mute myself so that we can get started with your program. And thank you for joining us. You can take it away. Great, thank you, Taylor. Um, it's, it's, it's a privilege to follow Roger in his presentation. I wanna thank you all for the invitation to join you tonight. My name is Sarah Martin, and I am a public historian with an interest in local history and the built environment. And I recently prepared two um, City of Seattle landmark applications for properties on Lake Union. So my discussion tonight will focus on Lake Union in particular. Those applications were for the Center for Wooden Boats, um, their South Lake Union campus, and also for an early 20th century houseboat that was home to the late Richard and Colleen Wagner. And they're best known for their role in co-founding the Center for Wooden Boats. So those applications very much dovetailed with one another. And, and both properties have been uh, designated by the city landmarks uh, board. And um, I'm proud to, to, um, to let you know that they're the first floating buildings in Seattle to be uh, designated as landmarks. And I, I definitely want to thank Historic Seattle for promoting those, those applications. And um, we, we had a, a pretty wonderful um, public response to those two applications. So thank you. And it's, it's, during, it's from this recent work that I've, I've really come to appreciate just how, how rich the lake's story is. And the lake means many people, many things to many people. And um, I've, 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 come to see it as, as many places. It's a workplace, it's a neighborhood, it's an airport, it's a natural environment, it's a park, it's a classroom, it's a tourist attraction, it's, it's many things and it goes on and on. So one thing I've learned that's a common thread through all the stories that I've, I've researched about the lake is that it's first and foremost um, um, a story of change. So the, the, the setting that, that Roger um, gave in his stories, the, the beautiful and the bountiful setting is, is first what, what drew um, European Americans to, to settle in this area in, in the mid 1800s. However, they viewed the rich natural resources very differently and they viewed it through a lens of business and industry. And, and they, they saw the forests to be harvested, um, the hillsides to be mined, and the waters to be fished. So these newcomers, um, a few here noted on the map, such as the Mercer and Denny families, um, they saw great potential in, in Lake Union as an industrial landscape and as a way to connect Lake Washington with, with Puget Sound. So this began decades um, of efforts to alter the landscape, as they would say, to improve it, and the lake, the lakeside and its shore, shoreline to maximize it for, for profitability and for usefulness. So Lake Union from these early, you know, mid 1800s um, played a, a starring role in the development of, of the city of Seattle. So an early sort of change or alteration to the lake was, was completed by some Chinese laborers who were hired by lakeside um, property owners and developers. And that was uh, a small canal or, and locks that connected Lake Washington with Lake Union. And it was through those locks that they were able to, to bring small, small boats, small canoes and, um, and logs, float logs through that they floated down to the south end of Lake Union where there was a mill and they processed and shipped them from there. By the, the, the 1890s, as you see here, um, industry had really taken root um, and there with a network of, of rail lines around the lake and, and a massive lumber uh, mill anchoring the south end of the lake there. So a, a real significant change on the lake came in 1907 uh, when the Washington legislature 
authorized the sale of state-owned shoreland um, parcels along both Lake Union and Lake Washington. And those sales, um, they funded the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition that was held a few years later. So what the legislation did is it extended buildable parcels out into the water. So the images you see here in this 1912 map show um, an example of these shorelines there at the south end of Lake Union. And the map, what I like about this map is it gives sort of a faint outline of what um, the shoreline looked prior to uh, too much infill. And, and this, is, um, this is where investors then, they snapped up parcels and they began uh, developing and infilling with, infilling with, with uh, soil and debris as a way to kind of extend their property out into the lake. And this is also, you know, this is 19, 1910, 1912, 1914, we start seeing more, um, more and more houseboats appear on Lake Union. And as the image on the right shows, um, these were, were, were small, they were no more than floating shacks. They were um, um, homes on the lake that, that housed working class uh, people and, and short-term residents. And those folks were largely working in the lakeside shops and, and mills. So as the, the photo sort of suggests, the, these were um, largely unregulated and, and, and pretty unpredictable in terms of uh, uh, residences for these people. So activity on the lake um, really kind of grew in anticipation of the opening of the ship canal, which happened in, in 1917. And new bridges were built at Ballard and Fremont, uh, East Lake and Mont Lake. And there were changes to the lake itself at this time. These included um, nearly two dozen water access points that were, were cut into the shorelines. Uh, around the lake. And today, you'll notice these as the, the 23 um, public waterways that, that ring the lake still today. So, so at this point, um, after the, the ship canal opened, um, we started to see more marine related industry on the lake, um, including, for instance, the Lake Union Dry Dock, which opened in 1919, um, and an assortment of small boatyards like Blanchard's and, and Grandy's and Jensen's. Um, this period was the real industrial and boat building heyday of, of the lake. And um, I'm talking 1917 through roughly World War II. Now this, this map depicts um, Lake Union kind of right in the middle of that time at, at 1930. And, and so with, with industry um, came jobs, obviously, and then with with that came the need for more housing, more worker housing. So what the map shows us uh, pretty interestingly is all the industry on the lake plus the little uh, colonies of houseboats that, that ring the lake as well. So um, what is also interesting about the map, it's, it's drawn by Dick Wagner and he's depicting the lake right before the completion of the Aurora Avenue Bridge, which it, it was completed in 1932 and it, it cut off Lake Union to those tallest and biggest um, ships. So by the late 1940s, after World War II, um, Lake Union is one of the busiest and most highly developed industrial areas in the city. Um, at this point, there are five flying services using the lake. Um, and then this is at the same time with with the old boat yards jockeying for position with um, um, fishing companies, gravel and asphalt plants. Um, and at this time, right after World War II, more than more than a thousand houseboats are crammed in around Lake Union. So this, this was not a real sustainable path for the lake um, at this point. So there were some pretty significant changes um, on the horizon. Um, I, I kind of think of the closing of the lake, um, the gas plant there at the north end of the lake in 1956 as ushering in sort of a new era in the lake's history. And um, that's also after the closure when interest began to develop in, in the lake's environmental well-being and its shoreline uses. 
and maritime interests started to percolate and, and, and the public began thinking about how to access the water. So all these conversations were happening sort of in the 1950s and, and they turned to action um, in the 1960s and 70s. So it, it was around this time in the late 1960s that the Wagners, um, um, Richard and Colleen, started their, their boat livery business at their floating home. This is just off of West Lake, kind of at the south base of the Aurora Avenue Bridge. And they began in the mid 70s starting to host monthly meetings of fellow wooden boat enthusiasts. And in part, these people were, were all reacting to the change that they were seeing around them. So the closure of, of some of these old boat shops, um, the loss um, and sort of the, the, the rotting in place of, of some of these old wooden boats. And they were part of a renewed interest that, that was emerging in the Pacific Northwest in, in the 70s um, that was really focused on reviving these traditional wooden boats and all things wooden boats. So the group um, incorporated in 1978 as the Center for Wooden Boats. And the center actually operated its first uh, few years out of the Wagner floating home. So meanwhile, while this is going on um, in 1972, uh, Washington voters um, approved a pretty significant piece of legislation, the Shoreline Management Act. And, and this was requiring local municipalities with with shorelines to, to develop sort of master programs that would dictate how, how shorelines were used. And the city of Seattle adopted its shoreline program in 1977. And it outlined um, specifically goals and, and use regulations for how Lake Union would, would look. And it was basically to ensure um, a diverse use of the shoreline. So Lake Union was was absolutely ground zero for, for some of these real contentious issues in the late 70s and early 80s. These included you know, issues around water dependent uses versus non water dependent uses and, and shipyards versus marinas, recreation versus industry. So this is all happening when in 1980, um, the Center for Wooden Boats, their, their board and, and, and Dick Wagner, um, submitted their plans for um, to the city to, to use um, Waterway 4 at the south end of the lake as the home for their permanent campus. And this would prove to be a real, a real early test of the city's shoreline program. And it's, it's one reason that it took, it took three years for the center to gain access uh, to Waterway 4. So the photo here at the top shows Waterway 4 and what it looked like um, just as the center was, was sort of granted permission to use it. Dick Wagner in one of their, their sort of bi-monthly newsletters called this, this, this parcel, he called it uh, a pothole wasteland, which it indeed, indeed was. And the center would take several years um, to fully develop their campus, both the, the water side and the shore side. So what this proved to be was, was a real early test of, of the water, um, of the shoreline management program. And, and, and the center was leading uh, the transformation at this time of South Lake Union. It was, it was transitioning from a true industrial landscape to more what we see today, which is a public maritime heritage center. So it, it now includes, um, this area includes Mohai, and an adjacent pier with um, several historic ships that are maintained by the, the Northwest Seaport. And of course, if you, you know, the opposite end of the lake, if you look north toward Gasworks Park, that's another landscape that has been transformed from an industrial uh, past into what's today a, a public park. And in between these places are, are places where recreational boaters kayakers can access the lake through these public waterways I mentioned that, that business and industry had once used. But amidst all of this transformation, um, there are clear vestiges of the lake's past that are surviving and thriving. 
Um, they include the Lake Union Dry Dock Company, which continues to operate still today, uh, a century after it opened. And of course, we all know seaplanes are coming and going from uh, the terminal at the south end of the lake, um, almost 100 years uh, of that as well. And today still, um, there are more than 70 uh, shared docks with houses, uh, floating homes that total just over 500 on the lake today. So it's interesting to think about, you know, the shoreline management program um, has been, you know, in effect some 40, 40 plus years. And it's interesting to think about how, how the city um, has, has, how the lake has changed and, 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 and think about whether it's actually living up to, living up to that uh, goal of, of a diverse shoreline. So I want to kind of end my my remarks with a few takeaways. These are takeaways largely that I've had during these these projects to document these properties and it's it's obvious that this is one of the most heavily altered water systems in our state. Um, all of the, the the brief stories I've just told happened within the last, you know, 150 to 170 years and that's that's not a lot of time and that's an amazing amount of change to have done that. And second, you know, we, we didn't really get into it much here, but um, the, lakes, the lake's history is full of really interesting characters. Um, you know, in reading all the, the, the research, I learned about Terry Pettis, who was um, quite the character. He was a, a instrumental in the Floating Homes Association and, and actually Dick, Dick Wagner called him it was interesting, he called him a genius. Um, he was a retired newspaper writer and, and he knew how to really coach the underdogs in, in advocating for the Floating Homes Association. So he was a really interesting character as well as a, a guy named Had or Harold Wolf um, who was a fuel dock owner in the 30s and 40s. And, and he delivered uh, fuel oil to houseboats all over the lake on a couple of boats that he called Blondie and Dagwood. So, so these types of characters are, I know there are many, many of them. And it's, it's interesting, Dick, Dick Wagner himself actually highlights many of these characters in his, his really great book that's called Legends of the Lake. Legends of the Lake. And um, he gives kind of several essays on just different themes and topics. And, and he really, really gets into some interesting people and characters. But if I had more time to devote, I think, to, to studying the lake, I'd really wanna know more about, about women and their interactions with the lake, um, especially given what I learned about Colleen Wagner and, and her life's work in educating uh, people, young and old, about um, the lake and, and its marine heritage. So just to kind of wrap up, um, the lake, clearly means different things to different people and it's a really special place and I'm, I'm really thrilled tonight that, that David Wagner who who grew up in the Wagner floating home is here tonight so hopefully he will you'll have some questions for him about what that experience was like and hear his story about living on Lake Union so I wrap it up there and toss it back to you Taylor thank you so much all of was very helpful as someone who grew up here i didn't know some of what you shared and i know that, that was a fraction of the information um that you now know about lake union and the silver wooden boats and the wagner floating home so thank you for um all of the work that you've done working with us and consolidating the uh, wealth of knowledge that i know you have <laughs> into 20 minutes really appreciate that um and again thank you to roger now is our q a time or and or comment time so you all are more than welcome to type your questions in the chat um, or unmute yourselves and ask a question in the chat. Sarah, I really liked your uh, <laughs> suggestion uh, that perhaps we have David, if you want to, David, unmute and just tell us a handful about your experience growing up um, in the home that I believe, yes, you're in your home right now. Um, if we don't have immediate questions, and I don't think we do unless I'm missing someone's hand, if you would like to, I would love to open the floor up to you, David. And you can say no if you don't. <laughs> and it looks like there's a question. Uh, hello. For you. Uh, it's okay. I don't, I don't know if I have too much. Oh, there's a question? Okay. 
I do. There's a question for you, and then in the uh, chat. In the chat. Um, yeah, I can read it to you. It's a question from Jeff. <laughs> so, what was um, this? Is a great question, Jeff. Yes. Yeah, so what was trick or treating like at the old boathouse? And also, can you please tell us about the swimming pool at your family home? <laughs> well, uh, trick or treating, we still did all that stuff. Uh, we definitely would hit up all the houseboats on the dock, and that was fine. There was actually other kids on the dock too when uh, my brother and I were young. It was another family with kids. Uh, but we usually go to another neighborhood and go up to Queen Anne, and, uh, where there's a lot more houses, slim pickings on the dock. And uh, as far as the swimming pool, uh, it was great. It was kind of where we learned how to swim um, while not, you know, being in the depth of the Lake Union, which is 40 feet under the houseboat. But we had, my dad designed a house for somebody um, just down the street, Dave LeClaire House, who doesn't own it anymore, I think. But uh, he was uh, also an architect or uh, he was a boat builder. And uh, he was so grateful he brought his uh, swimming pool over and it was just kind of small, but it had a diving board and a slide and a bottom to it and a fence around the outside so keep us safe. And it was great. We had a blast. Thank you. And everyone listening, like I said, we did film, we did a virtual tour um, that will be available in a few weeks. So we'll add some visuals um, so that you all can better understand um, the pool set up at the home. So I also just wanted to mention, I really appreciated uh, Roger's talk. Uh, it was a great story. Thank you, Roger, for that. I agree. Lots of uh, life, lots of to take away. And just for everyone to know, when I uh, first spoke with Roger, uh, you told me, I think, a different story. And so I appreciate now that I've gotten, I think, four <laughs> different stories um, just from our planning process uh, of this particular program. So I hope that we can have you back actually for longer so that we can hear more about um the living history of the place that we're in right now whenever you're ready i'm down and i don't want to take away the opportunity for other folks to ask questions so if you do have a question like i said you can put it in the chat um, or you're more than welcome to unmute yourself if you're on zoom and just go ahead and ask and if you're on youtube watching you can just put that in the youtube chat and i'm turning back and forth just to monitor both screens. Okay. okay. Well, I won't force us um, if we don't have questions, but Sarah, Roger, David, if there's anything else that you would like to share, it looks like we're going to wrap up a little bit early today. Um, sure, I might, I might just share a a couple um, suggestions for folks if they're interested in in diving a little deeper into um, some of the stories about Lake Union. Um, there's a great book called um, Seattle's Unsinkable Houseboats by Howard Droker, and it's it was published in the 70s. It's a little bit dated by now, but it's a really really great deep dive into all things um, floating homes in Seattle, and then. Um, there's another great book if you're interested in the boat building traditions um, on Lake Union during that heyday I talked about. Um, uh, Norman Blanchard sort of co-wrote um, his memories, and it's it's called Knee Deep in Shavings, and it's a it's a pretty interesting read about his experience in the boat building industry on Lake Union. So I'd, I'd recommend that as well. And then of course at you know, not to, to plug to plug something, but the center has um, has in their in their little gift gift shop and bookstore has um, David Wagner. I'm sorry, Richard Wagner, Dick Wagner's books um, book Legends of the Lake. That's it's a wonderful book of his essays, and he's a a pretty great storyteller himself. So um, be sure to pick that one up if you're interested. Wonderful. And it looks like we have a couple of questions, and then. 
I will come back to you, Roger, um, for just a follow up and ways that we can either keep up with you or just learn more about um, stories and history. But the first question in our chat is um, mainly for Sarah and David and Jeff. Um, the question reads, I'm wondering how unique the process was to landmark floating properties since it had never been done before. And then the second question that's somewhat related is, what do you think the future of houseboats will be on Lake Union? Just for, for the group. Yeah, I think um, in terms of the first question about how unique the process was, uh, we, we did go into it a little a little blindly not knowing kind of where the what necessarily what questions the the board might ask but I know in our early conversations between Jeff and I at least we talked about um, thinking about the floating home as as, as as landmarking a vessel because there are vessels you know historic ships that are listed and those do those do move around although the houseboat is technically something that could be moved it's, it is pretty stationary at this point but we kind of thought of it as an object when we were um, um, documenting it so um, beyond that you know that's that's what we went into the process kind of thinking is that your recollection Jeff anything else to add to that I, th I think that's right Sarah I mean, it was um, you know we had some interesting discussions with the city staff about about this and um, the location is I think significant for the, the Wagner houseboat like it's one of the early communities and the character of the community is really I think part of the whole story um, but it's kind of complicated to how, how you protect um, really sort of a floating object more like a clock or a you know a vehicle or a vessel as opposed to a piece of real estate where you have a legal description that ties it to the land so that was kind of a unique um, way to go about it, but our hope is certainly that it kind of remains at that place because it really is telling the whole story of that that community. Yeah, and and the boundary I think they wound up with designating is is pretty much the the floating building itself and the platform and its foundation. So it's it's attached to a, a, a cooperatively owned dock, but it's basically that houseboat and the structure it sits on that that it that was designated. Thank you both. David, do you have anything um, to add to either or both? I was going to say you never want to move this house. It's, it's been here for so long and those those logs, whatever was told in those logs in the first place is, is I don't think it's there anymore. And we did put in that kind of box the outer logs in place and then the flotation that we've added over time kind of pushes them up too but i would i'd be really scared to ever move this out yeah um <laughs> to lose whatever's under there um it's really interesting seeing i see a more and more often since the year I've been back here, just living in the houseboat, was here in North, uh, houseboats coming in, like modern ones that are kind of barges, and it's really different than, than how this house was built. Um, so that's, I think that's part of the sort of value too, it's just the fact that is floating on 110 year old old gross locks that are there and providing the support of this house. Uh, I don't think, I think the houseboats are here gonna be around for a long time to come because I'm um, just seeing it's like become very popular and a lot of people are bringing in these new ones and hopefully they're Picking up the old ones too, but uh, yeah, I'm just seeing more and more. It seems like. And and I I think David to add to that um, about the future of houseboats, I think they have a, a pretty great advocate in the Floating Homes Association. The the association's been home been around since since 1962, and 
and um, they have a great website with lots of history if you're interested, but, but they're pretty rooted and pretty deep advocates for the houseboat community as well. Thank you both. Well, we are at our five minute mark and I've seen a couple of comments in the chat. Thank you all for, um, for these comments. Any other, um, before we close out, I guess, are there any other questions for our guests? And if not, then um, Roger, I definitely want to turn back to you and just ask, um, how do we find you? How do we keep up with you? And for those of us who are very interested, me, um, in hearing more stories about where we live and how, um, how all of this came to be, how can we do that? Um, I was going to mention that um, I believe I got, I got the acronyms, I think, but the Friends, Seattle Friends of the, it's either Seattle Friends of the Waterfront or Friends of the Seattle Waterfront. Um, is it the second one? Uh, friends of Seattle Waterfront. There yeah, are friends too. Are, um, <laughs> sponsoring storytelling, Native American storytelling, um, this Sunday at five o'clock. And every, uh, you got to write this down. Every first Monday of the month through um, August uh, at five o'clock and every third Sunday at five o'clock. I'm not sure how we, uh, they reach those dates, but um, um, more stories about uh, local tribal cultures. And uh, as I said before, um, when you hear the stories of another culture um, and you have what we call suspension of disbelief, at least, where you can just accept them as these are the teachings. My teacher said that the stories are called the teachings in the language of the local tribes here, the Lashitsa language. Um, Squadachi is the teachings. Akwasitagbish is teachings of the first people. And so she said, this is how we teach other people about us. We tell them our stories as the ones I've shared. So I'm always happy to share those stories. Uh, as I said, um, this summer, uh, Mondays and Sundays, first, first, first Wednesday, excuse me, and first, um, uh, third Sunday. I'll get that right. The numbers are driving me crazy. But um, this summer, if you check on their website, they said we're um, promoting it. Uh, they wanted to have a native voice on the waterfront to share certain things like the Kenny Battle song and some of the mythic uh, and legend stories that I've been sharing. So that's a good way to do it. And um, my partner, her name is Fern Renville. Um, she is a uh, citizen Wapitan, the, Co the Lakota Indian people. She's also a storyteller. And she'll be sharing stories as well from her people. Just to let people know that our identities are wrapped in and defined by our stories. And so um, one of the, I guess, tragedies you'd have to call it is another culture came to this land and said, your stories don't make any sense. Your stories aren't true. Therefore, we don't want to hear your stories. We'll tell you our story and you must follow the teachings of our story. And so um, many elders have kept these stories alive and I'm happy to share them with people to keep them alive and on their journey. The stories are journey and they're living things um, to uh, native people. And so therefore um, they need to be tended to. And, and taken care of and uh, helped on their journey because they're supposed to go across generations. We want them to do that. So thank you. Yeah, I, I'm doing that. And uh, I don't have a website. After all these years, I've talked about it, but I don't have one. So um, <laughs> organizations that ask me to do it, hopefully they'll be promoting um, whatever tellings I'll be doing in the area. All right. And Naomi was wonderful and shared the Friends of the Waterfront link with us in the chat. I'll be sure to include that in my follow-up email to everyone and um, would love to have both of you back, <laughs> truly, whenever you want to be here, um, let me know. And then for everyone else, just a reminder that um, we, that eight or so minute virtual tour of the Wagner home will be coming out in a few weeks. Um, Sarah did a wonderful job. Thank you, Sarah, for providing um, Really, she's our tour guide, you'll see, and it was great. And we've got some really great snippets from you, David, um, about some awesome stories of your childhood growing up in the home. And I think that is our time. I will, um, you all have my email address, so if you have any questions, or if you have questions for our speakers and you'd like me to pass those along, always happy to do that. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.